On September 23rd, 1857, a lone businessman sat quietly in a church at the corner of Fulton and William Streets on the island of Manhattan in New York City. His name was Jeremiah Lanfear. He was a lay missionary for the Dutch Reformed Church. Responding to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, he put together and distributed a flyer which read, a day prayer meeting is held every Wednesday from 12 to one o'clock in the consistory building of the North Dutch Church, corner of Fulton and William Streets. This meeting is intended to give merchants, mechanics, clerks, strangers and businessmen generally an opportunity to stop and call on God amidst the perplexities incident to their respective avocations. On that Wednesday at noon, the 46-year-old Lanfear sat alone until he was joined by one other a half hour later. Following, a few others joined, bringing the total to five souls. The following week, there were 15, and a week after that, 40. Within a month, there were over 100 gathering for this Wednesday noontime prayer. Soon, they were meeting daily at noon in churches across the city as thousands were joining in. By the end of the year, these prayer meetings were popping up in other cities across the nation. A newspaper reporter published the following on the phenomenon. Anyone comes in or goes out as he pleases. It's the rule of the place to leave at any moment. All sects are here, the formal stately churchmen and the impulsive Methodist who cannot suppress his groan and his amen. The sober, substantial Dutchman and the ardent Congregationalist with all Yankee restlessness on his face, the Baptist and the Presbyterian joining in the same chorus and bowing at the same altar. They prayed for an awakening of souls, friends, family, co-workers, and neighbors by name, and their prayers were answered. Historians estimate that as many as one million people came into saving faith as a fruit of their sowing and prayer. Many since have tried to emulate their strategy with varying degrees of success. Rather than their strategy, we must come to own their mentality, one of simple obedience and sustained action. The progeny of Jeremiah Lamphere persists in every generation May we learn to recognize humble obedience and join their call as we together learn to sow for a great awakening. And we say, Lord, do it again, amen. That incredible. I thought that was actually a, a really good, uh, thanks to John David Walt, who is a friend of this community, and those of us that know Jessica Legrone, it's good to see her face as well. But um, I remember seeing this, uh, this video several months back, and I mean, we're, we're in this series on the Holy Spirit, and we're, we're talking about the attributes of the, of the Holy Spirit. And when you watch that, it's, it's incredible, right? Like, like little acts of obedience, having these little nudges inside, and then being bold in the midst of it and, and watching something supernatural happen. That video is really not about Jeremiah Lanfear. It's all about what the Holy Spirit wants to do. It's all about what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And I wonder how many nudges, how many, how many little yearnings, how, how, many, how many times does the Holy Spirit push a little bit? But see, first and foremost, the Holy Spirit, this is what you need to know about the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit just wants to do a work inside you. That's where he wants to start. And when you truly surrender to that, it's amazing what the Spirit can do. So this week, here's where I wanna go. I wanna talk about the Holy Spirit as a sanctifier. Or um, you may know this word, convictor. I wanna kinda look at that. What did Jesus have to say about the Holy Spirit as a sanctifier? So we'll be in John chapter 16 uh, for a brief period of time, but then ultimately I wanna get to um, Ephesians, this sweet little letter in the New Testament. And I wanna talk about, all right, what does it really look like as followers of Jesus to live the sanctified life? So yes, spoiler alert, this is all about sin today. 
We got through the seven deadly sins, and I honestly think we came out better for it. So, spoiler alert, we're talking about sin, but more than that, this is about the freedom of what's found when we lean in to the sanctifier, to the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Now, I have to say this. Um, first off, I'm so thankful for Pierce and, and that prayer today. I want you to hear this. I come in, um, with a bit of a pull on me. I have the, the hope of the gospel being presented today, but I also just feel the weight of friends that I know that are in Israel right now, the weight of just the brokenness of the world. But don't we, don't we live in this tension every single day? So I just, uh, I wanna, wanna echo uh, what my friend Pierce said, and I also just wanna pray. You know, any time before I get into the word, I just kinda love to, to pray against the distractions and the things that pull us. So will you just join me in a, a word of prayer and let's dive into to this one today. Father, oh, I just sense the sweetness of your spirit here this morning. And I have to say, for every child's voice, voice for every baby's cry in this room. That does not serve as a distraction, but it is a reminder of the joy that's found in new life that is present. And I thank you for those sweet sounds. And Father, I thank you for this time that we come before you. And Lord, I just, I hold to, when we don't have the words to pray, I hold to the scripture Psalm 46, God is an ever-present help in times of trouble, therefore we will not fear. You are ever-present. That Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are not just ever-present, but you are also an ever-present helper. So Father, I just pray that you, Lord, would, would do the supernatural. But Father, outside these walls where war is breaking out, breathe peace. But God, I also pray over hearts, over lives that are inside this space. Those who are watching today, maybe they, they couldn't bring themselves to come to church, but yet the Holy Spirit said, turn on that live stream. There is something, Holy Spirit, that you want us to awaken to in this place, in this moment, right here and right now. So we sang it. But Father, I also pray it, open the eyes of our hearts for we want to see you. I ask that you would use me, speak through me, if not through me, in spite of me, so that your will and your words can be heard. Lord, we trust you, we love you, and it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray, and God's people said, amen. All right, if you have a Bible, uh, let's go. We're gonna go to John chapter 16 here in just a moment. Um, I did feel a little bit of conviction this week, which is, probably timely since I'm preaching on the convictor. Um, we're talking about these names. We're talking about the, uh, the nature of the Holy Spirit. Last week, helper. This week, sanctifier. But I also thought, how important is it to actually bring up the Holy Spirit's first name, which is this, holy, right? Like we have to understand. Remember we talked about last week, Jesus said, I'm not to his friends. He said, I'm not leaving you as orphans, but I'm sending someone to you. Jesus said, there'll be a time that you're not going to see me, but yet someone, not a, a mist or a vapor, he said, the third person of the Trinity is coming in, and he will not just be with you, but he will reside inside you. He will live inside you, and it is the Holy Spirit. We refer to the Spirit often. We say, wow, the Spirit was so present this morning. Wow, I just love to see the Spirit move. But we can't miss that first name, which is holy. And by the way, the Holy Spirit desires for his vessel as he comes into us. He desires for us to be a holy people. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober... Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. He's saying there was a time that you could pull the ignorant card when you weren't living a holy life. And that time is before you found Jesus before you gave your life to him, before the Holy Spirit filled you. So there was a time that you didn't know, but look at 15. 
But just as he who is called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do, for it's written, be holy because I am, someone say the word, holy. Now, it's okay if you raise your hand. Quick question. Who, does, who finds that like completely overwhelming? Like just be holy. Yeah, thank you. Mary, you're the only one I saw, but I appreciate your honesty. I'm right there with you. Yeah, be holy. Wait, how do you do that? Well, that's a great question. Let's camp out there for just a moment. I think rather than be overwhelmed by the idea of being holy, maybe it's important to just start with the other side. What is holy not? What does it not look like? Well, I would start here. Holy is not an isolate yourself from humanity life. Uh, let, me, let me explain it this way. I was, uh, we were in Greece earlier this year and I got an opportunity to travel to a, a monastery. Uh, look, it's a picture right there. Do you see it at the, the top? Now, you didn't have to rappel or rock climb. There were actually steps, thank you, Lord. But like monks live there. And in fact, like I saw the pictures before there were these steps and all these man-made things. Do you know how they get up there? There was like a rope basket at the very bottom, true story, like one, one guy at the top would just pull the rope. Now listen, I would live a fairly holy life if I was like depending on a rope to carry me 500 feet. You know what I'm saying? I'd be really close to Jesus. But I look at that life right there and for half a second, I, I just kind of hung out and boy, wouldn't that be nice. Living a life where you're just isolated, you're up there, you've just got everything, beautiful views. You could just read the scriptures. Hopefully there's Wi-Fi, I didn't ask, but you could, you know, put on Bristol House, the altars album, available streaming in all places now. And you could just shuffle it and just live there. How great would that be? Well, that's part of it. But here's the conviction that I had. If Jesus said the two most important things are loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself, listen, it's, it's hard to just isolate yourself and say, all right, I'm gonna hang out here and not also walk through the neighborhood with the people that you live with, right? So living a holy life, it's not isolating yourself from humanity, but you're in the world, but you're not of the world. It's also not a, a ladder that you climb of sinless perfection, where it's everything that you're doing to reach a place of perfection. You have to understand because of what Jesus Christ has done. This is nothing that we have earned, but it is a grace that has been freely given. Holiness is not a sinless life. I think we need to understand that and no, not take advantage of it. In 1 John chapter one, listen to this. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, here's what we know. He is faithful and he is just and he will forgive us of our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness. I mean, here's the reality. We strive for holiness. We pursue holiness, but we also know that the only one who ever achieved it is Jesus. Now, we don't take advantage of it. That's called cheap grace. See, to understand sin, the biblical definition of sin is just this in the Bible. It's missing the mark. It's missing the mark. So I would explain it a little bit like this. Stephen, right there. All right. What's that? That's yeah, target, right? So, so if you go with the biblical definition of what we're talking about, sin, it, it's just missing the mark. Now, remember, again, Holy Spirit comes to the believers. You confess, you're baptized in the Spirit, you're filled with the Spirit. So to be holy simply means we have the example of Jesus Christ. So, Frank, I love that y'all sit on the front row, by the way. So think, I'm, at one point, you're gonna go to the back, and I know it's because I call you out all the time. But Frank, do you see my imaginary bow and arrow? I've got it right here in my hand. Okay, great. Okay, um, here's the thing. Here's, here's holiness. This is who we're called to be. You live your life. You have Jesus as the example. You know where you're called to be, and then you, you just you go in that direction. The center right there, the 10, that, that plus sign, that's holiness. That's where we're headed to. What on earth just happened? Did that just appear? Okay, I had no idea that was going to happen. But see, the reality is, 
I don't know if that's the Holy Spirit or Stephen in the back. Either way, it kind of freaks me out, but we're going to be fine. <laughs> but that, I'll go with this illustration because the truth is, as much as I strive for that 10, I love that you did that, Stephen. The truth is, you're going to veer a little bit, right? Why? Because at some point, you're going to leave this room and you're going to get in your car and get in Houston traffic. It's not a matter of if. At some point, you're going to wander into work tomorrow or the day after. And listen, we know sin happens. But here's the thing. To an unbelieving world, they don't have the example of Jesus. They don't know that the good news of the gospel is good news. So where we're striving for this, the truth is, the reality, the unbelieving world, they have no target. So they're just haphazardly living. So we say, be holy. And that just means pursue holiness. This is sanctification. One of the best simple definitions of sanctification is this one. Sanctification is the process of becoming like Jesus, period. The truth is, I have a really good relationship with the lady at the cleaners. Why? Because I drink cold brew coffee 24 seven and I dribble constantly, <laughs> constantly. And I always wear white shirts. And here's a true story. I walk in and Becky's like, all right, what stain are we removing today? And I said, well, on this shirt right here, it's a big glob. I got way too excited, went up. And then she literally just a couple weeks ago said, okay, so what, what, what smell is this? What are we going with? And I think she sniffed it, pumpkin spice. And I went, that's weird, but yes, you have a very good nose. <laughs> so I take, what do you do if you've got a stain? I mean, I, I suppose I could kind of do this. And no, I want to take it to the cleaners. You want to get that taken out. Now, what I don't do is if I spill a little bit on my shirt, just take my shirt off and dip it into the venti trash can size cold brew that I'm drinking. No, you want to take it to the cleaners. So here's the thing about sin, and this is what we need to know, is that yes, sometimes you hit a seven, sometimes you miss the mark, but the truth is God is so faithful to forgive us of those sins, but we move towards holiness. Now, how do we get here? Well, that's the sanctifier. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 16. The purpose of the sanctifier, the convictor, the Holy Spirit. He says, but very truly I tell you, it is good for you that I'm going away. Because unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But when I go, I will send him to you. And here it is, verse 8. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. So the nature of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is a convictor to the world in regards to sin, righteousness, and judgment. So let's talk about the word convict for just a moment. Now, if you were to look up the word convict, here's the first definitions that I found when I typed it in earlier this week. To scorn, to bring into contempt, or to rebuke. And those are all right definitions. But what's interesting is when you look at the word here in relationship to what Jesus is saying about the Holy Spirit, here's the right definition. To convict is to show people their sins and to bring them into a place of repentance. Remember, the very first sermon that we see of Jesus in the Gospels is this. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And see, the amazing thing here, what we need to know is this, that the Holy Spirit will confront the world within believers and through believers. Charles Stanley wrote a little book called The Power of the Holy Spirit. This is how he said it, and I love it. He said, the child of God living on this earth, empowered by the Spirit of God, is a living letter observed by the world. And as the world witnesses the child of God being controlled by the Spirit, the world observes a life undergoing transformation. The world is confronted by the Holy Spirit via his activity inside believers. And here's what you need to know. <laughs> the Holy Spirit desires to use a channel. It's not a building that convicts. It's not a pulpit that convicts. It's not a symbol that convicts. It is a people 
wholly transformed Christians to confront the world. Now, have to also say this. To have the sanctifier inside our lives, to have the convictor, to be convicted of sin does not make the children of God the world's conscience. We are not the HPD, the Holy Police Department. We are not holy hall monitors. Don't you love those Christians? Looking around the world, writing down names and calling people out on their sin. No, that, that's, that's not the way the Holy Spirit functions. Now listen, do we hold one another accountable? There's some really specific ways that Paul was addressing the church, believers that had the Holy Spirit inside them on how they handle sin among the family, among the believers. But we have to remember it's not our job to remind unbelievers how bad they are. Here's where it starts. We just say, Holy Spirit, work on me. Start right here, right? Before you attack everyone else, we gotta say, Lord, do a work inside me. That's where it begins. And that's what the Holy Spirit can use. John Wesley, founder of Methodism, love this quote. Give me a hundred preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I care not whether they be clergymen or laymen, for they alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. This is that part where you say, amen. Come on now. Just get fired up. Yes, that's what this is about. That's the glory of having the sanctifier, the Holy Spirit at work inside our lives. The best prayer you can pray is this, Lord, burn away. If there is anything in me that is not of you, burn that away. And then what happens, we saw it with Jeremiah Lanfear. All of a sudden, the Lord begins to do such a work in you that he starts to come out of you. And the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit will work in the midst of it every single time. He desires to see holy, transformed lives. So how, how do you get there? Well, this is Ephesians chapter four. I love the letter of Ephesians. In fact, I would just encourage you to read Ephesians over the course of this week. It's, it's short, it's six chapters. But there's so much in Ephesians about the Holy Spirit. I mean, I love chapters one through three. Paul really just talks about doctrine. He talks about the Father. He talks about the Son. He talks about the Holy Spirit. It's all the head knowledge. Paul is saying to the church, these are all the things that you know. But then he moves into chapters four, five, and six, and it moves from doctrine to duty. Paul says, Ephesians 4, 1, therefore, as a prisoner to the Lord Jesus Christ, then I urge you to live lives worthy of the calling that you have received. What I love, Tony Evans says this about Ephesians. He's a pastor. He says, Ephesians teaches us to live a heavenly life in a hellish world. Come on now, that's good. You can capture heaven on this earth, in the midst of a broken world, here's how you find it, church. You find it through the power of the Holy Spirit that wants to work inside you. So real quickly, how do you, how do you live the sanctified life? I think it has to start here. The sanctified life begins by knowing Christ personally. by knowing him personally. Not knowing of him casually. Not just an encounter every now and then. No, no, no. It has to begin with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I have to ask you, have you ever had a moment in your life where you recognize the sin that you had, you confess that sin, and you invited Jesus into your heart. Have you had that moment where you have had a 
personal relationship with Jesus where you have regarded him as your king, as your Lord, or do you have a casual relationship? I have to tell you, he's inviting you to so much more. Maybe the faith that you have, it's not your faith. You're holding on to someone else's faith, but you've never just fallen to your knees and confessed him as your Lord and personal Savior. I want you to know there is no distance you can go. There is no sin that you can carry. There is no pumpkin spice stain that you can have on your shirt that the Holy Spirit can't cleanse you from, but you have to begin with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I think a danger for me, I'm always very aware, I look at this in my Bible every time I come up here, it's dangerous for me to assume that everybody that I look at, that you have all given your lives to Jesus. Before there was ever a great commission where Jesus said, go and make disciples, it began with a great invitation where Jesus said, follow me. If you've never given your life to Jesus, look at me. He's offering you a great invitation today. It's not your parents' faith. It's not anyone else's faith. This is a personal relationship that he's calling you into. Living the sanctified life, it has to start here, turning directions. Look at where Jesus is. Look at where Jesus is calling you to go. Admit that, confess that sin, and enter into a relationship. But here's where it also has to move. It has to move here. Ephesians 4, Paul says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and, read the last word, there it is again. You find this over and over. Paul says, yes, begin with the right relationship. That's the beginning of Ephesians. But he says, here's where it has to go. You've got to put off the old self. You have to renew the attitude and the mind and put on the new self. And that's where you're called to live. I see it this way as the band comes out. Lazarus, right? A story where Lazarus has died. He's a friend of Jesus. And Jesus' lady gets there. He's dead. And Jesus said a prayer. And then he looks inside this tomb. And he says, Lazarus, come out. How's this for a good Halloween story, right? And what happens? Everybody looks. Here comes brother Lazarus. (laughs) Now, he's wrapped up. You know that, right? Like, they bind him. So, sweet Lazarus, I'm sure he's like, oh, the Lord. And Jesus, get it, it's in the Bible. Fact check me. Jesus says to his disciples, hey, unbind him. And I, in my mind, he looks at Peter, and Peter's like, I'm not touching him. John, unbind him. They're all like, you unbind him. No, you unbind him. But you know what? One of those brothers at some point went up, and they cut that binding away. Why? Here's why. Because he was dead, but now he's alive. Because he was wrapped up in grave clothes, but when Jesus sets you free, you don't need the grave clothes anymore. You're wearing, cheesy preacher quote, grace clothes, church. Get rid of the dead. Get rid of it, cast it aside. Jesus says, do you want to be well? Then take up your mat and follow me. The enemy wants to bind you in your mistakes. The enemy wants to trap you in the sin and the failures and say, holiness, you're never going to get to a place where you're holy. But Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. Take one step towards me. Now take another. Just keep, keep following me. Remember, Jesus says, come to me if you're weary heavy laden. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. In other words, Jesus is saying that, listen, the load that we carry is hard, but he wants to share that. He wants to align right up beside us the grief that you're carrying, the hurt. Jesus just wants to put an arm around you and say, let's just take a step today. It's okay. Let's take another step today. These sweet babies, when they start walking, very first time you hold their hands 
You let go, they stumble, they fall. As parents, we don't go, what's the matter with you? Why can't you just walk? No. What do we do when they take a couple steps? And they stumble and they fall. And as parents, what do we do? Just help them right back up. So friends, the sanctified life, it's not a suggestion. Holiness. Don't just try it out. Pursue it. Just follow in the footsteps of Jesus. I don't, here's the thing. I don't know where this word meets you today. But for someone in this room, for someone who's watching, you've never surrendered to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I felt it when I woke up this morning. Prayed over you. And if I don't even see you today or hear from you today, I'm just gonna continue to pray. Because that's the goodness of God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. John 3, 17, for God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, to tell you how bad you are, to tell you how broken you are, but instead it's this, to save the world through him. You don't have to be your brokenness. You don't have to be your sin. You don't have to carry the stain. Just surrender to Jesus. Doesn't get easy, but he is right there with you and there is a church community that wants to throw their arms around you. Maybe you've grieved the Holy Spirit. Paul would go on to say, don't grieve the Spirit. That word, grieve, if you've ever said this, something to someone that you love and you said something wrong, you hurt someone, have you ever seen that face? You say it, you attack or whatever, and you just emotionally hurt them, and you just, you can see the wound in their face. Okay, that's the word grieve. It's a love word, when you wound someone that you love. So Paul says that maybe we slide. Maybe we choose sin. Maybe we're not really targeting Jesus and his lifestyle and we're going in the opposite direction. Paul says the Holy Spirit, you grieve the Holy Spirit when you do that. Why? Because you were created for so much more. Here's the thing. Grave clothes, cast them aside. Grace clothes, let's go. All day, every day. Let me pray for you. Gracious and loving God, I... My goodness. What a joy to know that we are loved. What a joy to know, Father, that you couldn't watch from a distance, but instead you stepped into our neighborhood, you stepped into our story, and you showed us your nature in the person of Jesus who became the sacrificial lamb willingly, died a sinner's death on a cross, and then rose on the third day. And when that veil tore in two, Father, it changed everything. That all are welcome into your presence, that the Holy Spirit has come. And I just say, Holy Spirit, light a fire inside your people. Holy Spirit, may we be a people who are travailing in prayer. May we be a people who are passionate about pursuing holiness in our lives. And in doing so, loving the world out of it. Bold in the way that we find the least and the lost, the oppressed. Just sharing the love of God with all that we know, Holy Spirit, sanctifier, convictor, just begin with us and out of that supernatural power as a result. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to move into a time here as we sing this last song. Um, gratitude, which is perfect. I want to just open up this prayer time that if you need prayer in your life, uh, as you come forward, as you kneel, if you open the palms of your hand, that's just a reminder that our prayer team, some of the pastors were here and we would just love to pray over you. If there's a heaviness in your life that you just wanna lighten that load, let that go. We're here to pray for you. Also, if you're the one, the one that walks away, Jesus will walk away from the 99 to say, 
hey, I see you, come home. If you wanna give your life to Jesus today, that prayer's there for you as well. Now for these next few moments, let's respond as the Holy Spirit leads, amen.